thank you for, for having me here and thank you everyone for, for joining us. I've got about 20 minutes with you and when I, when I thought of masterclass, I, I thought, oh, I should have some profound ideas to share with you that hopefully will inspire you. And I, I tried really hard to come up with, you know, profound ideas to share with you. And then I thought, I think the best thing I can probably share with you today is, is my personal story, my journey uh, into the field of social entrepreneurship. And it's especially unique and, and, and hopefully relatable to many of you because I, I started exactly uh, in the same place that many of you are today. So I started when I was in college, I, I started as I was kind of transitioning out of out of university and thinking of what of what next in, in my career and and you know the questions we come up with right grad school jobs you know other things that you could probably do start your own business a social entrepreneurship is is a very unique field where where you can also make some space and so i want to share my journey of, of how i made that happen and, and what i do today and and hopefully that that sparks a bit of inspiration gives you a bit of ideas but to hear all about you know what your dreams are what your ideas are and, and ways in which i can Hopefully there'll be a, an opportunity for me to also be able to hear some of your ideas and feel free to kind of participate uh, in the chat. Now, now before I, I start uh, sharing my story, I actually want to ask you all a question. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to think really deep and give me an answer to this question. What does coffee mean to you? There are some people who don't like coffee. There is like a disgusting sense of coffee as well. Comfort, I, I see comfort. Uh, a treat, it's an energy, caffeine, sense of energy. Someone says coffee is the elixir of life. I couldn't live without it, except for the people who do not like coffee, for whom I, I do sincerely apologize. Uh, for the ones who, who do enjoy a cup of coffee, a lot of the words that we associate with the word coffee are these positive ideas, these positive emotions. It, it's what gives us energy every single morning. And that's what it did to me about four or five years ago. When I was in college, I was a, a junior in college, and coffee was pretty much the source of my survival in, in university. So, so, so to many of you, I, I really completely feel your, 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 your passion for coffee, but then something you really unique happened, and I'm going to kind of continue sharing my screen to, to, to take the rest of the story. In about 2015, as a junior in, in college, I was in, in a very small school in Indiana. I, I happened to get an opportunity with one of my best friends to travel to Costa Rica, which is where I'm calling in from today. And, and we got to spend about a month in, in the southern part of the country. Uh, and it's a very heavily coffee producing region. And we, we came in for a very different project. It was a, a school project, you know, something that, that we were doing on the side. And we got to spend about a month in the, in the community. And what happened to be is that everyone was producing coffee. And December, which is when we were here, is the harvest season. So everyone's picking coffee, everyone's processing coffee. What you see in this photo behind you is, is, is coffee being dried for about 20 days after it's been picked and, and, and washed to, to kind of give it that firm taste that, that we all enjoy. So we got to see all of this exactly at the time that we were here in Costa Rica. And as, as we were having some conversations in our broken Spanish back then, we asked the same question to Doña Erika, who was one of the producers that we met. And we asked her, what does coffee mean to you, Dona Erika? You know, she was heavily involved. She was, she was picking coffee, but she was involved in other elements, waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning, working pretty much all day. And we asked her this question because it really seemed like a really beautiful act to do, right? And her responses were trabajo, which means work, dinero, which means money, and medio de vida, a form of life. And that was a very stark difference for us as consumers, as, as people who enjoy a cup of coffee that gives us energy and passion in the morning, to see that the people who are at the end of the chain, the people who are producing our coffee, looked at coffee in a slightly negative and perhaps difficult way, right? It was a source of income without which you couldn't really survive the next year. It, it was a form of life. It's what you've always known and there hasn't been any other alternative. And so we, we started kind of trying to understand a bit more about what was happening. So when we went back to college, we still had about a year and a half. We, we started doing some more research and we found that Erika, Doña Erika, was, was one of 5 million smallholder women coffee farmers around the world that heavily depended on coffee for their livelihoods, that, that needed coffee, not as a source of energy or passion, but as a source of money and, and, and a source of life. And we went deeper. We started doing a bit more research because just having one story, having gotten a slight perspective was not enough for us. So we started doing more research so much so that we created our own class uh, in our senior year in, in college. And, and we started researching and, and understanding that producers like Erica were facing two challenges. 
The first one was the price volatility, and the second one was gender disparity. Coffee prices over the last 10 decades, and this is very interesting for, for all of you who are interested in supply chain, right? The commodity market, which is where most of our products are coffee, cacao, tea, is traded, has been extremely volatile, especially for coffee in the last 10 to 13 years. It's been as low as 91 cents per pound of coffee. And, and, and if you look at the average cost of production, the average cost is $1.4 per pound. So they're earning 91 cents for something that they're spending $1.4 for, right? So there's a clear loss. You don't need to you know, study economics or business to understand that. So, so that got us thinking of, of why are producers you know, living in this, in this really difficult environment, whereas we as consumers would go out there and purchase a, a $3, $4 cup of coffee and really think that, oh, like the people at the end of this, when you look at their photos, they're smiling, they're probably making a good living. So we did some more research and we found that there was a second layer to this problem. The second layer was one of gender. Despite making almost half of the population, more than half the population in, in the coffee production space, they were actually excluded from a lot of the decision-making processes and they lacked the knowledge to sell directly to these fancy speciality markets, right? So when we pay for a cup of coffee, $4, we're probably paying to a very kind of fair trade local shop, but that local shop is not necessarily always buying from a smallholder women coffee farmer because women coffee producers have less access to those kind of markets. And so there was this kind of double layer of the problem. It wasn't just one problem. And then we started also looking at the opportunity. It was not just that there were problems, but there were also opportunities. We discovered that there was an $80 billion you know, market for, for consumers who, were, who would be willing to to pay a bit more and purchase from an unknown brand if they knew that it had a strong CSR commitment. So this wasn't just a social problem, this was also a great business opportunity. And that's very important when you're thinking about social enterprise. You want to make sure that you can sustain yourself and you want to know that you have a, a market understanding. So that led us to start Bean Voyage. I hope you like the name. The, the name comes from the, the French Bon Voyage, but a bit of a play on the, the concept of the journey the bean from the farm where it's produced to your cup right in, 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 your, in your doorstep and in, in your kitchens. So, so we started this as a nonprofit social enterprise with a mission to eradicate gender gap in farming communities around the world. It's a very big mission. It's quite ambitious and fairly vague, but we said we're going to start with coffee. We're going to focus on the coffee supply chain and we're going to kind of disrupt this in supply chain first and then focus on other products. So what we do, it's called Care Trade. We provide training and market connections to smallholder women coffee farmers around the world. Basically, the, the producers take part in a two-year training program during which they form small groups. There are usually about 30 women all in one group, uh, and they learn together. And we provide the resources, the knowledge, the trainers required to improve their quality of their coffee uh, and the yield of their coffee. Once they complete the training program, we connect them directly, directly to buyers around the world from Canada, United States, now we've started working in Europe and soon we're expanding to South Korea as well. And all of that kind of combined allows for us to increase the farm income for smallholder women coffee farmers. And farm income is very important because when we say we want to eradicate the gender gap, that's a really big, big, you know, we're, we're making a big promise. But to work towards eradicating that gender gap, the first step is reducing that income gap, the, the farm income that farmers earn. So we were starting with, with something that is very attainable, something very small with the hope that soon we can expand and, and focus on other things, right? So, so for now, we focus on, on increasing their farm incomes. So where is, where is Dania Erika today after about five, five and a half years? She's pro producing more sustainable coffees. She's earned enough money to make her own processing plant at her own front yard. So this is this photo in the middle is from her own house. And she has direct access to coffee, to, to markets, coffee markets around the world, and is, is now trading coffees in, in Canada and the U.S. with our direct trade partners. And she's now earning $4.3 a pound. So if you remember that figure that I was mentioning earlier, it was 91 cents a pound of coffee. And, and the cost was around $1.4 a, a pound. And today we're able to guarantee $4.3 a pound, which is even 200% higher than the fair trade marketplace. So we had our first class of, you know, we worked with Dani Erika for about a year and a half. We thought, oh, we could maybe expand and, and grow this program. So the next year we actually worked with about 16 women. We had our first very proud class. If you can notice me in, in the bottom there, that's, that's us, me and my co-founder in the center. Very, very proud after our first 
group of producers completed the program. We then expanded to a, a second group or two more groups in the next year. Last year, we, we kind of started scaling up a bit more. So started working with about 70 women. And this year, very, very proud. We've just last week launched a scaling of the, the program to all countries, all, all regions, sorry, of Costa Rica. And we're working with over 250 women, smallholder women, coffee producers. So it's been, it's been a tough journey, but we're, we're very proud of, of the, the process. Um, these are just some photos of the way we took the coffee. This was in the initial days. So most of these pictures was where we would ourselves pack suitcases of coffee and take it to markets anywhere in the world. So you can see pictures here from um, Berlin. We did a couple of shops in, in Paris in South Korea, here in Costa Rica in the United States. So we really would take the coffee. Literally the idea of Bean Voyage was to take these coffees directly from the farm. The producers would not only produce them, they would, they would roast it, they would package it, we put in our suitcase, carry it all the way to the markets and tell people these incredible stories of the women that we were lucky to work with, 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 a, with a kind of idea that they're going to be more conscious, but more importantly, they're going to put their money uh, into the, the right places and ensure that most of that money went back to the producers. And it did go back to the producers. So this is a quick, what we call the FOB price in coffee. And this works very well with many of the supply chains. Right now, 96% of what is paid by our clients is, is going directly back to the producers. And then there's about 4% that is between exporting uh, a cut for bean voyage and a, and a national fee that we're able to pay. And, and that impact when you translate it in terms of a comparative graph is, is, is 200% greater and actually more in, in some cases than any other current industry standards. So whether it's the commodity market, whether it's even fair trade or even direct trade, what we have come up with, what we call care trade, goes beyond that because we don't treat trade like just an exchange of goods, but an opportunity for our buyers and our producers to, to create a bond, a strong bond. Uh, and when that bond is created, price is just a number. At that point, you, you have consumers that are around the world who are willing to pay that extra dollar or two when they know that that money transparently goes directly to the producer. A couple of impact metrics, and I'm sure you know, you've heard the terms impact metrics in, in, in your classes. Uh, a couple of Im impact metrics that we look at include farm profit and gender agency. And the, the four sustainable development goals that, that we're targeting are gender equality, no poverty, decent work and, and economic growth, and responsible consumption. So just a quick roundup of, of some of the milestones since we started in, in college. We, we, we started this in, in junior year, senior year. And over the years, we've had some really incredible opportunities to, to meet some really incredible people, receive some great awards that has really put us in, in, the, in the map among consumers, but also among other supporters and partners. Uh, a couple of kind of media exposures. I do want to skip through some of that, that section. And finally, just a, a quick shout out to my co-founder. And, and this is something that I'll talk in, in a few minutes, but you know, this journey is impossible without having a co-founder, especially because the world of social entrepreneurship can be quite lonely. So having a co-founder was extremely important. So, so you see my co-founder, Sunghi, kind of, we're, we're tasting coffee here. So this is what we call cupping when we're tasting coffee for, for their quality. Over the next few years, our goal is to keep expanding. So we're trying to expand into 70 communities around the world, thinking about going to Guatemala next. So if anyone's from Guatemala or, or knows of anyone, we're, we're really looking into that. We're hoping, as, as you might have seen in the initial video, we're hoping to work with 3,500 producers in the next two years. And we're going to be training more youth, local youth to become trainers so they can take up some of the work that, that myself and my co-founder were doing ourselves in the last few years and growing our market presence around the world is the plan. So I'm going to leave you with these five key takeaways from this journey that, that, that has been interesting for, for myself and, and for us at, at Bean Voyage. The first one, and I think I mentioned it earlier, is to find a partner. It's very exciting to be that lone social entrepreneur, but, but I found that generally, unless you, you struggle working with people, it is amazing to start having a co-founder from the very beginning. So you might think you have the most incredible idea in the world, uh, but there's always going to be another person somewhere else in the world who will have the exact implementation idea that you need to be able to be successful. It also helps to, to avoid burnout. You can kind of lean on each other, which, which I found extremely, uh, extremely helpful. The second thing is to take your time. I think there's a lot of conversation around scale uh, and this idea of like, you know, you know, do something with a couple of hundred people or a couple of people and then just scale it up. Right. I, I personally believe that it's, it's better to build a model that works for your you know, key, key stakeholders, uh, especially in social entrepreneurship. You're, you're oftentimes working with different stakeholders, right? We work with coffee producers, but we also work with consumers. 
And so we have to be cognizant of the two groups that we work with. And, and at the end of the day, make sure that the coffee producers we work with are at the center uh, of our work. So really, really suggest you to take your time in building a, a model that works for, for the producers or for the group that you're targeting. Play with the devil. So this is a very, very controversial one, but I'm sure all of you can imagine we work in coffee. There are a couple of devils that are very well known in the coffee sector, right? Devils are, are you know, all around your, your path towards breaking that, that status quo. My recommendation is to actually work with them to further your own mission. A lot of the times you can find creative ways of working with those so-called devil to, to, to really further, further the bigger mission. Fourth thing is to prep and then pitch. I think people have a, a very strong ability to detect BS faster than you, you can imagine. And so don't just focus on pitching your, your great idea, do that as well, but do more prep than you can pitch. And I think the, the rule is the 70, 30, 70% 70 preparation, uh, and maybe around 30%, you know, pitching. And finally, and this is an important one is to, to focus on doing less harm and not just more good. I think there's a, a, a lot of literature around doing good, do, you know, being involved and starting up, but, but we need to avoid the allure of, of just solving problems if you don't understand it. I think Spud talks about this quite beautifully when he says, you need to understand the problem, you know, kind of in a holistic manner before you try to solve it. And, and that means sometimes interning with another company that might eventually be your competitor. That might mean that traveling to a community and just spending some time and, and just listening and, and learning without having to think of, oh, what's the solution? What's the idea? And so oftentimes it, it can mean listening and then just actively being engaged. So these are my, my quick five takeaways. I want to thank you there because I, I, do, I do want to be mindful of the, of the time that we have with, with each other. If anyone at any point would like to get in touch, this is my email. That, that's our website. Please do get in touch. Uh, if there's any way in which we can help support um, your process, your growth, your journey, we're, we're always there. And I'm personally very excited to, to learn more about your path. And, and thank you very much for, for, for making time to, to listen to me.